Hi, I'm Inga and I'm the muscle. I'm Sam and I'm the mouth. And we are, are status, status queer. queer. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I met up with Sam and Inga, aka Status Queer, and they told me about the amazing work they're doing here in Gothenburg. I'm Sam Message, I'm one half of this artist duo Status Queer. Alongside that, I'm a drag performer using the name Schott Ungen, or Meatling in English. With that, I do kind of queer, punk-ish, surreal, political things on stage, keep it nice and vague, and I do comedy. I've also got a background in working in museums and archives, and you know what it is being a visual artist, you have like a, your fingers in all of the pies possible. I am Inga. Outside of Status Queer, I work as a visual and performance artist. I mostly use the method of auto theory, which is like a feminist writing method where I write myself into popular narratives to like rethink them, reimagine them through a trans and gender non-conforming lens. And I love to use eroticism to like critically approach themes, I guess. And together, they formed the artist duo Status Queer. We've been working under the duo name Status Queer for two years now, just over two years. Basically, the idea with Status Queer is how can you use art and culture to build a new kind of community? And the way that we do that, we have these two kind of methods that we call the spatial and the relational. The spatial is asking like how can shape and color and texture and light, how can these things come together to kind of mold interactions between people or guide certain interactions? And then the other side, the relational is like, how can we make interactions between people kind of scripted or not scripted? How can we make these interactions so that people have kind of specific, build kind of specific relationships with each other? So our kind of overall artistic question is how these two things, the spatial and the relational, come together to be able to build this new community that we want. They met about three years ago, shortly after Sam moved here from abroad. Um, and I met someone in a bar who said, I know someone who knows someone who knows someone who's non-binary. <laughs> Which I was like, great, how do I get in contact with this person? <laughs> that non-binary person actually introduced me to Inga. And I saw them and I was like, oh my god, there's somebody else who looks like me. Like, they must know what's going on and what's queer in this city. <laughs> and I asked them, like, what's going on? Where's it at? Where are people getting together? And they were just like, oh, they're just not. Like, there's not a place like that. Tragically. Tragically, because I had just moved here, and then I'm like, oh shit, I've just moved to this place where I really don't want to be then. <laughs> uh, so from that very moment, we were like scheming about like, how can we try and make something in the city that will be fabulous and something that we can go to and just want like, kind of be at home ourselves in. Yeah, exactly. It was mostly for us. Selfish reasons. Yeah. <laughs> this whole project was yeah. like, I need to survive. I think also having come from other cities or having been in other parts of the world where like queer communities thrive in a very kind of public way really helped drive this like desire. After about a year, they replied to an open call for artists that led to them being offered to host a performance week that they chose to call Sparkplug. And when we started planning it, we realized like, okay, it's like system change that is the goal here. We don't want it to be like a festival that just happens and then it's gone. Our question was like, we're here, we're queer, but what about the rest of the year? Yeah, um, that was the slogan. The original it's slogan. The slogan. I mean. <laughs> oh, we love a slogan. We love a, we love a title it's name. True. We spend so much time like coming up with title names. <laughs> it's the best part of any project. <laughs> that and like getting the money in the bank account from the funders. For yes, sure, for days. sure. They have some really interesting thoughts on why the social, political and cultural landscape looks like it does here in Gothenburg. Obviously Gothenburg is one of the most ethnically segregated cities in Europe. It's also very socially stratified and it means that these layers of segregation are also carried over into the LGBTQ plus community. And the other problem that we were thinking about is that Gothenburg obviously has a history of violence towards queer people, this whole history of Bergknackerstaden, like faggot bashing city, that I think has left some kind of cultural trauma almost, that it's very closed, people are very guarded, there's like a very high level of separatism here, and I think that all of these factors come together to mean that like if you're new here or you're newly out, 
it's very, very difficult, or was at least when we started, it was really difficult to find a place to go because yeah. it was just like groups of friends meeting up and doing stuff. And if you don't know someone who knows someone, then you're fucked. But also what we understood at some point is that Gothenburg works in this way that like people are really, really organizing a lot and then like everybody burns out or leaves or whatever and then there's like this big dip and it seems that we've, we arrived just in the dip. Yeah, then we started thinking about how we could use Sparkplug to really spark the building. Hey, we love a name. <laughs> to really get the motor going. Spark um, connections <laughs> between people. And to fund this, they applied for some of the many grants that exist within the Nordic countries. So what we realized was that the project could be a lot bigger than we had kind of previously imagined. Yeah. So we started looking at if we could build this into like an international thing. So we started by building a, this network of queer artists and community builders called The Queer Agenda. That's the name of our network. And we got funded for that, which was fabulous. So we started by having a bunch of online Zoom meetings where we used kind of different drawing techniques and techniques to like abstract things and then reinterpret them to explore kind of queer utopias and dreams. And then we took those utopias and dreams, took some of those ideas and carried them through into the festival. And then we invited all of the network to Sparkplug to deliver their own program points as well. Then followed a couple of very stressful weeks leading up to the festival. And one thing that happened that makes me so stressed hearing about. We had a little incident at some point where a 10 oh. liter bucket of mint green paint exploded in a van that we rented. Oh, it was so bad. <laughs> As we were going round a roundabout, there was just this bang in the back of the van. <laughs> the three of us in the front, we were looking at each other like, it is what it is now. Yeah, let's just, you know, like it's not, it's not, whatever's happened is not going to unhappen. Let's just keep driving. And we're driving over Hissingsbrun. And um, you could just like smell paint in the car. And someone's like, can you smell paint? And we're like, no, no. Psychosomatic. Oh, exactly. You're just imagining it. Like, don't worry about it. We get to the venue, to Gallery Box, and we get out of the van. And it has been like, the van has been dripping. <laughs> mint green paint along the road from the bridge to gathering box <laughs> and we open the door and it's just like a puddle the whole thing then we got uh, this beautiful photograph because i was covered in this mint green paint and that was basically the the visual that we had for the for the festival so art imitated life did we say exactly. life imitated art <laughs> in that moment it yeah. was great in the end. It was. It's a good story. And the whole festival was created on a very small budget. But we paid everyone that worked with us. It's very important, you know, that we try to, as much as we can, pay people for their work. If we are working with an artist and asking them to do something, then we are not asking them unless we have money to pay yeah, them. It's exactly. really important that we kind of set an example in that and that like our role here is really to try and fight for the money so that we can give it back to people in the community exactly. because we are in this like very privileged position of both having had like extensive access to university education we both have master's degrees yeah. and we both have the tools to navigate this kind of bullshit art bureaucracy around this like professionalism in arts and culture and our kind of role is to try and use that to give opportunities to other people in the community who yeah. don't have this same level of access. That's exactly. like such a key part of what we're doing. So what then, more exactly, was Sparkplug for those of us who unfortunately didn't go? So Sparkplug then was like our big experiment in this relational versus social methodology. So we made this big spatial installation in there and the concept for the space was that in the back room, there was this yeah, portal to a queer utopia and everything in the space was leaking out of this portal um, and into the space. And it was supposed to be this kind of like in-between space between this queer utopia, yeah. kind of beyond in the imaginary and like the bullshit world of cis, het, racist, sexist, classist, ableist, ableist bullshit <laughs> going on outside. <laughs> and then what we did throughout the week is we were like uh, hosting all these different workshops and each workshop left like a trace on the space. So if it was an illustration workshop, we were then like, putting all the illustrations on the walls, or we did a muraling workshop where we made this tool called a together tool, 
which is a tool that you need lots of people to operate. And so it's lots of people holding on and then there's just one brush and they made a mural on the wall together like that. Something we work with a lot is this idea of claiming space and claiming a space together and thinking about what kind of group feeling that makes in the room when you really like build this kind of ownership. And they were very successful with what they were trying to achieve. And the idea was, you know, if you came to one thing at the beginning of the week, you might come to another thing and then you might come to a more relaxed, like social event. Mm -hmm. And in that time, you kind of build a connection with the space, which let, makes it easier for you to like open up to other people and be more kind of receptive. And I remember, I think it was like the Sunday morning, I was in the corner, I think having my like 10th cup of coffee at that point. I mean, <laughs> it had been round the clock work for several weeks at that point. So yeah, I know I'm having this coffee in the corner and I'm listening to these people who are sat in this conversation circle. You know, there's someone there who was racialized, there was people who are older and younger. I know there was someone there who was living with a disability and they were all, you know, very different people. And they were all having a conversation about like their kind of queer experiences in Gothenburg. And I was just in the corner thinking like, oh my God, this whole thing, all of this work that we did for a year leading up to this has actually worked. It was like the best <laughs> feeling ever. That was, that was pretty so cool. cool. And as their slogan suggests, they have been working towards creating more queer spaces since then. We run a series called Mortgiftet, or The Antidote, which is about trying to create a kind of little pocket of queer and trans friendliness and support and care and joy in this kind of, like I said, bullshit world of uh, cishet patriarchy and all this other bullshit. With that, we work with different artists each time to giving people different tools to deal with that world outside or different ways to connect with each other. So that can be through dance or through finding ways to collaborate with people in a feminist way or making soundscapes to kind of escape into a queer utopia. So that's uh, one of the projects that we're working with now that's still ongoing. And the other one we're calling Initiations. And like I said, we love a title, we love a theme. So when you complete the Initiations program, you're initiated into the cult. So cult is our drag performance collective and drag night. And so Initiations is a free school where we have an open call and then people apply. You know, it's not like a, I've done this and I've done that kind of application. It's more like, why do you want to do this? Because it's the point that people with no access and no experience can get involved. It's the only thing that you need to get involved is just a desire for like, I want to do drag. Yeah. And then we are here to like, you know, with the expertise and the experience <coughs> and the knowledge, to try and help people make their first drag performance. So over a series of like eight to 10 weeks, we have a series of different workshops and explore how to make a character, how to uh, do your makeup, how to make costumes, how to conceptualize a performance, how to perform it. <laughs> how to navigate the energy levels exactly. within the performance and also what kind of experience you want the audience to have. And and this is why they want to get a drag scene going in Gothenburg. Drag can be something radical and political. It's like this very exciting way to bring together the community into one space and to get people thinking about different kinds of kind of issues within the community. Yeah. Because people are going up on stage and really like saying something from their subject's position, it can really bring awareness within the community of like what's going on with other intersections and what kind of struggles are out there and what kind of things are important. So we're using drag very intentionally to try and like sharpen the political voice of the community. Yeah, so each drag school has a theme. So the, la the first one that we did was the cult of consumption. So the initiations, we were thinking about consumption the whole time and then the performance night is everything is about consumption. Apart from this, they have so many projects going on that unfortunately we can't cover in this video. One thing that they're doing that I think is really cool is that whenever they are hosting a workshop, they have this system that makes sure that those that are most marginalized get prioritized to get a place in the workshop. It feels like they're really here for the community. To wrap up, I asked about their dreams for the future. One of my dreams would be to because we work with this project full time, more than full time sometimes, and we are compensated so poorly for it. I mean, right now we are 
gloriously living on a salary of like 6,000 crowns a month each for doing this. Yes. Um, and that's because we won quite a big grant. But obviously, that is not a real salary, and that is not like a reality that most people in Sweden want to live. So I, one of my dreams would be able to like not have to worry that I can't pay my rent and feed myself from doing this job. I think <laughs> dreams as well would be like that people from the community would want to start organizing themselves. And we have tools and knowledge to help facilitate that and that more and more people get involved and start organizing their own things. We talked a lot about, like internally, about the ecosystem of like cultural organizing that people come, they get excited, they get interested, they want to start organizing themselves and then we can kind of help you know, start things or people can get involved in organizing with us or something like that. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. I really, one of my dreams for Gothenburg would just be that there is like, it continues growing in the diversity and the frequency and regularity of yeah. queer events. Part of that is, yeah, making like safe separatist spaces, but also spaces where we are like mixing together because we, you know, when we start filing it down, we are really, really small groups. And if we are not like standing together and giving solidarity and fighting together, then we're not going to be able to achieve what we need. We're not going to be able to continue this struggle for rights. And I think something that's really scary is that we have seen the struggle for rights doesn't just go in one direction. You know, we have seen what's going on in the States with this rollback on trans rights. We've seen in the UK that trans healthcare is getting harder to access through like legislation. And, you know, there's some kind of political movements that are starting to really not look good for the trans community in the UK. And now we have this bin fire of a Swedish government. We need to be in a situation where we can stand up for each other when yes. we need to, but we can only do that if we understand each other's needs, if we know each other, and if we know when and how to stand up. Also, I guess, off the back of that, my dream is through these uh, events and through these mixed spaces and continuing to get to know each other, that there just becomes more of a community yeah, exactly. in Gothenburg. If you enjoyed watching that video, please like, comment, subscribe and share the video. I really appreciate you showing your love in that way. If you also want to support the channel financially, that's possible via Patreon, but really no pressure. See you next time.